Mount Zion is a place where we live, love, and learn. Family, good morning to you. Good evening to some others and to all. Welcome to Bible study here at Mount Zion Baptist Church. I am Curtis Bryant, and I am so glad you decided to join us for Bible study today. For as we continue our series, Depending on Jesus, we are now going to jump into how we can depend on Jesus uh, for courage within times of injustice. Now, I know there is someone out there, I scratched that, Everyone out there has at some point dealt with injustice before on some level. And God has shared with us through this lesson and through your own study, through your own experience, that we serve a God of justice who will make sure that everything is always made right. And through scripture, through our study today, you will also see again how we can depend on Jesus for times of injustice, how he will give us courage in moments like that. So again, I welcome you by sharing with you what's on my heart. It is a joy to be among the land of the living. It is a joy to fellowship with the family of faith and a joy to worship and study with the people of Zion. So family, friends, people of Zion, will you please join me for a word of prayer? And gracious master, we praise you. We praise your name and we thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do in our lives. We praise you in advance for knowing that you are a God who is always looking out, who is able to take care and who is intentional about justice. God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to just die, not to just die on a cross as a symbol of injustice, but to be raised so that everyone will know that the devil will be served notice, that you will make things right, that you will reconcile, and that you will show us justice through Christ. God, we thank you for the cross and what it did for us, how it took care of the gap that existed between us and you, as you make of you make the extension of yourself, uh, as you ensure that we do have justice and reconciliation through you, O oh Lord. So we thank you now for that and this lesson that we have together. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said amen. So family, thank you again for joining us for lesson six of this series, Depending on Jesus, Courage Within Injustice. I invite you to download the study guide. You will find it on our church website. As always, if you're looking on your desktop, then highlight the tab that says the church, scroll down to member center, and then highlight documents where you will find this. And if you're looking through a tablet or a device and you want to find this a study guide, please uh, just click on the menu button and then scroll through until you see documents. I believe it's in alphabetical order, but nevertheless, I know it's there. So please grab this uh, study guide and follow along with me. And as you follow along, either through the study guide or through this lesson, then I invite you to find our verse of study, our story of study for today. It is in Acts chapter 16. So please locate yourself to Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 40. Now, it's an extended story, but it reads pretty fast. And it's actually picking up on lesson two that we did in this series. So if you go back, it's a continuation. That one, I believe, was about frustration. And this one is picking up with uh, injustice. It's a story about Paul and Silas. And again, we're picking up on their story. And we will see moments of injustice here and how we know we can depend on Jesus in moments of injustice, that we can find courage and lean on Jesus for courage. So again, we'll pick up in just a moment, Acts chapter 16. But first, I want to share with you this centering story that is given to us by the author of this study. And then we will jump into the study and learning how we can depend on Jesus for courage in injustice. So here's our story. Here's what's going to bring us all together and get us on the same page. It says, when U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts, when he addressed his son's ninth grade graduating class, he offered some unconventional wishes, which include these words here. Judge Roberts says this, from time to time in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of, just, of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It is a way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. So this is an excerpt from his speech given to his son's ninth grade graduating class. That's 
eye raising right there. But there is some important nuggets that we're going to glance back at this and make sense of a little later on. But this is what he said. I hope essentially that you have moments when you have injustice happen to you for good reason. Now to switch uh, shift gears from that story to now getting to the scripture, it says the followers of Jesus Christ, they frequently met and endure injustice and disloyalty. The apostle Paul and his companions often found themselves treated unfairly. And of course, Jesus himself, who was innocent of any sin or crime, received the most unjust treatment of all, hanging on a cross. That is the most unjust treatment anyone could ever receive back in biblical antiquity. Jesus did that. So as we consider this notion of injustice, can we talk for a moment, what makes something unjust? This is a group discussion question I want everybody to contribute to. If you're in a space where you can, where you can type, where you can voice uh, or lend your voice to this question, I want to ask you, what makes something unjust? Do you have a response to that? What is your definition of what unjust is? How do you know it when you see it, that something is unjust, that something ain't right? Go ahead, if you have the ability, go ahead, throw that in a chat space so we can all see where your head's at, where your thoughts are. If you are so led to answer that question, that what makes something unjust? By definition, uh, following um, this excerpt that we just read a moment ago, where this judge, Judge Roberts, was asking and saying that I hope that you have injustice, injustice in your life. Uh, what do you see as that? And then secondly, I want to ask you this question of personal reflection now. How do you respond to injustice against others? And how do you respond when injustice is done towards you? Now, this is a question of reflection that I want you to reflect. I mean, feel free, if you want to do something on your own, to respond on your own in the chat space, that's fine too. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to throw an answer in there that has nothing to do with you. Because we all know what the right thing to do is. We all have visions in our minds as how we're all supposed to respond to injustice. Um, but, you know, we don't want to put on a facade right now. We don't want to put a mask on right now. I want you to really think about how do you respond to injustice against others and how do you respond to injustice against yourself? You know, I will be so um, transparent to say, I wish I could do more when it comes to injustice against others because my definition of somebody who, can, who does combat injustice in the right way, I'm so far from that example. Um, you know, I, I, I can't compare myself at you know, this point in my career to somebody like Martin Luther King, who was before my time. Um, I wasn't able to follow, through, uh, unless I looked through history books or so, to see how he moved. But if I have a practical example of somebody, I will look at someone such as Dr. Freddie Haynes, who is the pastor of the Friendship West Baptist Church down in Dallas, Texas, who is, if I could find any modern-day drum major, uh, he would be it. I mean, he is continuously on the front lines of making sure the needs are met for his community, where in Texas is a battleground state right now for voting rights and voter suppression. We all know if you follow the news, you see what's happening down there, that he is marching continuously for all those. Uh, he is in the forefront of a movement to make sure that injustice is taken care of as he is uh, moved by God. And I see him. He, in my mind, is like the standard, the benchmark, and I am not that. And so as I look and answer the question for myself now, I'll transparently um, giving that personal reflection to you all, I was like, wow, I wish I could do more because I see him and how it looks. Granted, it's a high bar. Uh, because this is in this man's DNA. He's been doing it for so long. Uh, but that's what I see. And that's what I compare myself to as a standard, or look towards as a standard. Somebody else like a William Barr. Dr. William Barr is another one who we know leads the, the poor people's uh, movement or initiative, so to speak. Always looking out for those who are voiceless, the ostracized, the, out, the overlooked, the outcast. Th those are who I look to as examples. And I'm not there. Not yet. Um, but that's how I see when I look at injustice towards others. I, I, I want to do my best. I want to do more. And so that's what I look towards. Now, against myself, something else I'm still working through. 
because I see where you know I may have been done wrong on a, you know a few occasions or levels think that I, that I notice, and as I reflect, I'm like, man, I should have said something, and and I'm learning because I have been kind of non-combative um, to to non-confrontational in a lot of things. And it's not until recently that I've really discovered that, you know, I have a voice, a valid voice that should speak up for myself and not just avoid things for the sake of keeping peace, that I need to open my mouth. And so it's, again, something that I'm learning and growing into. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. But there are others who may be in different spaces. And so I want you to understand where you are now. Locate yourself in the spectrum of how active you are. Or if you're not as active as you would be, then really give thought to, okay, why am I this way? Why do I carry it this way? We're going to look at how we can also lean on Jesus for courage so that if we're not where we want to be, we can at least know how to get to where we should be. Do you follow? So this is the purpose of our study today. All right? So now getting back to the scripture um, and the study now, it says this, that after the events related to study number two, again, uh, Paul and his companions sailed to Macedonia and began to share their message with a group of women in Philippi. A businesswoman named Lydia was converted to Christ and opened her home to the missionaries. And then things soon turned troublesome. As this and the following studies will show us now, the Bible takes demons and demon possession seriously. And now we're going to see the example of what injustice looks like here. So now let's turn to Acts 16 and begin reading the story, beginning with verse number 16 and going to verse number 40. So this, this part of the story is highlighted Paul and Silas in prison, which many of you are familiar with. The Word of God reads, and this is the, to my understanding, a New International Version, all right? Uh, follow along whichever version you may have. It says, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future a fortune teller, all right? She earned a great deal of money for her, for her owners by fortune, teller, by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days and finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they were severely flogged, they were thrown in prison. And a jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in their socks. In their stocks, excuse me. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, 
They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from prison, requesting them to leave the city. And after Paul and Silas had came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say thanks be to God. Such an incredible story, I think. Uh, in so many levels, first to know that you could be walking in the will of God and yet the worst things can happen. That Paul and Silas were doing their jobs. Mind you, we had a woman who was trying her best, a fortune teller now, trying to get in their ear and just, just making matters worse for them, just doing their jobs. And finally, by the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit. They commanded that spirit to come out. And because it cost some other people money, because it put other people in a bind for the wrong things that they were doing, well, then it caused them to say, well, let's throw them in prison. They weren't doing anything wrong, but because they inconvenienced somebody else who was outside of the will of God, well, now that's a problem. And it caused them to move. Now, when I say them, I'm talking about the those uh, business owners who are losing out on money now, cause them to have these brothers thrown in prison. It's amazing what the Lord's inconvenience can do, how it can cause an uproar for some people who are outside of the will. But one thing I know about the will of God, and we're going to get back to this story now, is that you can't stop the will of God from moving. I mean, these wheels are always turning. And while you may think, while the enemy may think they can interrupt the plans of the Lord, you can't stop it because even them getting thrown into prison, you see, God was not going to have them stay there. It's, it's, no, it's not within the will. And God's will has to be executed. It's just like a will that somebody leaves behind whenever they pass on and go on to glory, that it's an official document. You know what a will is that, that says that, okay, um, the next plans that I have laid out, what has been written out, has to be executed. That is the will. And when I look at God's will, I can't help but to get excited to know that there have been some plans that have been set in motion that is legally binding, where the earth has to agree to it and the spirits have to execute it. It's that God says this has to happen. And God's will is that we will not be chained or oppressed, that we shall be set free. That is the message of justice all by itself right there. That no matter what happens, God's will says things have to be made right. Things have to be made whole. Things have to be reconciled. And we have to lean on Jesus in moments to find courage, in moments of injustice. For if we know we serve a God of justice, then of course we know that whenever injustices happen to us or others around us, that God is going to take care. That God is going to execute the will. It's going to happen. So let's look now at the study guide and follow some of these questions. I won't cover them all, but I want to draw your attention to a few of them as we study this and look for injustice and how Jesus works through moments of injustice by giving us courage. Question number one asks us this. Up to this point, the work of Paul and his companions in Philippi had gone smoothly. Now, how does this encounter in verses 16 through 18 reveal the spiritual conflict going on behind the scenes? Well, we know that when we get to 16 and 18, if you go look back at those scriptures now, we see that on their way to the place of prayer, they were met by a female slave who had the spirit of fortune telling. Again, things were going smoothly for them as we read back in that last, uh, in, in session number two that they were doing the work and they were doing, it was going smoothly for them. But as soon as we get to 16, we see that this female slave who had the spirit on her got in the way and she followed them around and kept saying who they are. And she kept it up for Lord knows how long. It says many days, the Bible says. And then finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said, all right, you got to go. 
You ain't got to go home, but you got to get up out of here. This is what he said to the spirit and still acting within the will of the Lord. Can I point it out to you? Because we know what the Bible says in Luke when Jesus says, I've come so that the captives may be set free. This woman is a slave because of what was on the inside of her. People exploited her. She had owners, slave owners, who exploited her gifts for their benefit, sacrificing her. Days went on while they were in the presence, while she was in the presence of Paul and Silas, where she was acting in this and annoying them. But before they got there, she was already doing this so that they could gain from her. She was a slave to them and being used in this way. And again, the word of Jesus says in Luke, I have come so that the captives may be set free. Paul is doing his job, walking in the will of God. And he gets so annoyed by the enemy. He gets so annoyed by the slavery scene. He says, you got to be free. Something got to happen right here. I need you to, I need the enemy, the spirit to let go of you. Again, this is where I see he is acting in the will of the Lord. That Jesus came to set the captives free. The spirit of the Lord is in Paul and Silas. And they say to the slave, you got to be free of this thing. You got to be free of the means that somebody else is exploiting you. You got to be free of what they're doing or what they're using to control you. You got to be free of this thing. That's a shift. That's a shift right here. Saying this is where we see injustice taking place initially and God's stance on it. He would not have empowered Paul or Silas to say these things or do these things if it were not within his will that it is our job that when we see injustice happening for others, that it is our job to call that thing out, to say, you got to be free of this, that there is no reason why this should be taking place. Can we go a little deeper? Let's look at question number two, where it's asking us. It says, the spirit-possessed girl kept on shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. What she said was certainly true. And then it asks us this question, why then did Paul command the spirit to come out of her? Again, we see this as an acting or an execution of the will of God. This is the first instance in this story. It's amazing how when you are working in the will, that the enemy will know, that the enemy will target you and identify you. Mind you, it sounds to me, and I'm going to study this part more, but it sounds like to me that they weren't in some rural area or some place that didn't have a lot of foot traffic. I mean, these slave owners who wanted to exploit her gifts, of course they would have this woman occupied, and we're talking about Rome now, okay? Because we do identify that Paul, and you know, he's a Roman citizen, and we had Roman magistrates who were declaring that they need to go to jail or they'd be brought up on these charges. We know that we are somewhere in Rome. We know this, this is happening, and I would say, by the, the text or the context of this text, it would suggest that they were in some busy area or epicenter, whatever the case is. They would not have this woman being exploited in a place where they could not make money. There were clearly people here going back and forth, okay? Do you all follow me? Now, now, we find this woman who is shouting out, annoying Paul specifically. She knows that he is clearly acting in the will. And while she is spending all this energy annoying him, well, she's missing out on some others who may be around. It's just amazing to see how you could be targeted by the enemy when you're walking in the will of God. They missing out on all this money because this woman who is a slave now, you know, by the spirit inside of her, by these slave owners, she's targeting them. She knows who they are. She knows what kind of work they do. I want to pause right there and suggest this, that the moment that you align yourself with the will of God, doing the Lord's work, the enemy is going to know and the people around you they can't help but to see it as well. They're going to see it. You know, I, I hope that you are so tied and married to the will of God and doing the Lord's work that people can't help notice. Even if it comes from somebody in their circle. Can I, can, I, can I take you there for a second? Because I believe that the people who, 
would frequent these kinds of fortune-telling services probably found themselves outside of the will as well. This ain't a move of God. This ain't something that, that God wants to happen. Uh, this is a different kind of, of prophecy that's taking place, okay? This, this is a gift that, that is being used for all the wrong reasons. And, and I want to say anybody who went to this fortune teller to try to get some information about something, they were probably not in the right space either. And here, so if there's a, a, a line being drawn, then you got somebody like Paul and Silas in the will, and then on the other side, you have somebody like this fortune teller, these slave owners, people who frequent this kind of establishment or this, this business, this service. They're on the other side of it. And you have the other side pointing to this side saying these men are doing the work of the Lord. I hope that you are so tied to the fight against justice that when the enemy sees you, the enemy can't help but to point you out and to say, this person, this man, this woman is doing the Lord's work. And this person is here to do something that could save me and save everybody else. You, they know the work that you're doing. They know what you're capable of. They know that you are capable of setting the captives free doing the will of the Lord, to call out injustice when it shows up. And so while he was being annoyed at me and pointed out, Paul is like, well, this is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. Now, mind you, we see from the story, he was around this woman for several days because the Bible says she was annoying him for several days. And while he may have been there doing some other work with his attention towards other people, he could not help but notice that this woman over here is dealing with some injustice herself. And it's annoying me. It's getting to the point where it's under my skin. I can't ignore what's happening because it's in my face. I want to ask those who are watching, have you ever encountered injustice that has just been annoying you and been in your face? Can I help you now with what to do about it? You got to do something about it. That the slavery here, it needs liberation. That the bondage here, it needs God's touch. It needs God's intervention. And it's going to come through the person who is indignant about it. It's going to come through the man of God or the woman of God who is in with direct proximity of it, the one who is capable of doing something about it. I guarantee you that if it's annoying you, then you are the one that's got to do something about it. God has given you the power, and now he's given you the courage. And the courage by way of the story here, oh my God, is coming when you are getting annoyed by it. That something is now stirring up on the inside of you to say, I got to do something. I got to handle this. I got to get in the enemy's way. Because while I'm focusing over here, what I believe is doing the Lord's work, I can't help but to be annoyed by the injustice going on over here. And because there is an injustice here, then I got to handle the injustice here because the injustice is annoying me. It's getting on my nerves. I got to handle it. I can't escape it because it's, it's messing with me. Can we look at how it messes with us and how whenever we deal with the injustices, how it flips and turns everything upside down. Question number three, I like this. I may end up spending more time on this than, than I care to, but I want you to look at this. This question is very good. It asks us, once the girl was delivered of the evil spirit, a cascade of injustices followed one after the other. We find out what happens, the domino effect, in verses 19 through 24. Theologian uh, N.T. Wright says of these events that the combination of religion, money, and politics is asking for trouble. And Paul and Silas got it. So now, it asks us, how were the, the missionaries subjected to unfairness through each of these three forces? And the three forces that the question is asking us to consider is, number one, religious, number two, financial, and number three, political. Can we explore those for just a moment and then draw a parallel between where they are, what they see in the Bible, and what we see in our own society? 
Because see, for them, number one, religious persecution, well, they believed in something different. They believed in a different God than what was occupying there. Oh, my gosh. When you consider the, the, the climate of who should be worshipped in that time, well, all allegiance and all worship went to Caesar. All allegiance went, allegiance went to the one who was in charge. This is why they had images on the denarii or the coins or the, the currency that was used in that time. And here we have Paul and Silas, who we know believe in something totally different. So now when you go back to what this woman was doing as a fortune teller, as somebody who could predict something that may be unseen to some others in their minds and to the naked eye, it was her job as they're walking through. She's saying, these men serve the God of the most, you know, the most high God. These men know how somebody can get saved. That's scary. And this is now bleeding into the political piece of this, but I need you to stay with me because salvation in biblical antiquity, in this time, when we're studying the history of this text, it meant something totally different than how we view salvation right now. Because see, salvation for us, this is the misnomer, but we look at it strictly through the lens of, okay, I've secured my reservation for eschatology, for the end times, that when this life is over, you know, when I fly away, that my days will be spent with the Lord because I have made the confession, I believe, and I lead a life where I'm being led by Christ. We think of salvation in that regard. Um, sometimes we miss over the fact that salvation for us also means that we have a life that we're continuing to live in, in the earthly space that God is keeping us through Jesus from some stuff that would try to damn us some stuff that would try to drag us down, okay? But for the most part, when we talk about salvation, what it means to be saved, it means that, okay, when we die, we go to heaven. We spend our eternity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For them, salvation meant something else. For them, salvation meant that we will now be freed from Roman persecution and Roman government because Rome had a lock on everybody and how the country worked. Because if you didn't follow Caesar or follow the order of Rome, then you were being persecuted daily. You were being treated unfairly da daily. This, this is what salvation meant for them, that some, somebody save us from the way things are right here. This is salvation for them that take us from this Roman occupancy and this Roman rule and this Roman control, all right? So if, if you stay with me, if you follow that, now you have this woman who we know has the gift of predicting stuff. She's following these two men around saying, hey, these men believe in another God, and it's these men who can tell you how to be saved. Do you see where this is going? This woman is not only annoying them because she's putting them and their business out on blast, but she's also messing up things for those who are in control because she's saying this as though, all right, although I am part of the establishment, I'm telling everybody who also subscribes to the establishment that if you want to be saved from the establishment, then you got to follow these guys right here. You got to believe in something different. So now we're talking about the religious aspects of what was going on here, but how it bleeds into the political realm as well. Because now we have a shakeup. We have a mix-up. We have uh, another allegiance to, uh, allegiance to a different power that is now being presented in front of them. So the magistrates now, as the charges are being brought, drawn up, mind you, they had no idea of the citizenship. They had no idea that Paul and Silas were uh, Roman citizens. They're saying, okay, well, look, we got these two men who are here who have come in this place and they've shaken up the order of things. They've caused financial ruin for these slave owners because they're preaching a message of liberation. They're preaching a message of justice because Rome is trying to control everything. We have people by way of slave owners who are controlling people. 
and getting money from people, the money is going back to Roman power and Roman hands and Roman control. So now as they are being presented in front of us, the magistrates now, we're saying to them, you know, we have no problem with locking y'all up. We have no problem with flogging you. We have no problem with beating you and sharing with you and showing you you have no business here. That all this, this message of justice, this message of freedom, this demonstration of freedom and liberation that you just showed us through this woman by freeing her of the spirit. No, we don't stand for that. We're not about that. And so we're going to do something about that. So now we have religious aspects, believing in something different, believing in another God and not Caesar. We had the financial ruin here where you're messing up the money that we send to our God, the one that we believe in, in Caesar. And then we have political uh, ruin here where there's another system in place where somebody is trying to take the control away from the captors by setting the captives free. Because clearly, these men serve the Most High God. And these men can tell you how to be saved. These men can tell you how to be free from this kind of bondage. It's amazing what this story does for us. And clearly we see that these men, Paul and Silas, are now subject to injustice simply by working the Lord's will, walking in the Lord's will, executing the Lord's will. We see now they are the recipients of unjust treatment. But again, we know something about God. We know something about how God sees injustice in our lives. And I would say this to you. I'm actually going to end on this note. For those of us who see injustices happen and are annoyed by the injustices that we see happening, you know, while it bothers us by what we see, I understand that some of us don't make a move because we're afraid of what can happen to us. I totally get that. I totally understand because some of us can't fathom, I mean, the extreme here for Paul and Silas to be locked up, to be bound somehow, to have resources removed or have freedoms removed or liberties removed. It's hard for us to consider like those who go on marches, you know, those back in the day who would do sit-ins, those who would stand up for justice, that they knew there was a possibility that they could be locked up, they could be arrested, they could be detained, that kind of thing. It's hard for us to see the injustice and then do something about it because we know this may remove me from a platform. This may put me in this position where I can't do for anybody else. I totally get that. That we do have the reality that addressing injustices around us would cause us to be put in a position that we did not ask for or did not welcome, did not want from the beginning. This is what happened to Paul and Silas, that as they're walking in the will and doing the Lord's work, then even they were thrown in jail. And you would think, of course, that is unfair. But I believe the message that comes out of this story and the message that God wants to communicate to all of us who are justice workers now, that God is going to take care of us that as we see injustice happening, that it is okay for us to step outside of the box and to do what God has called us to do, to combat and confront injustices, to do for others who are being mistreated or treated unfairly, that even if it compromises our platforms, our freedoms, our liberties, it will only be a temporary moment, for God will care for us. Because once we connect with God through prayer, in our moments of compromise, reminding God that, hey, you called me to this, and God, I believe that you got me in this. God will come to our rescue. God will shake the foundations for us. This is how far God will go to ensure you that justice is what God is all about, that we are sent to combat justice. And when those captors or those who live and thrive off injustice come for us, that God will come for us as well to show us that injustice will not stand, that justice will reign because God will reign.
because God is always sovereign. God is always in control. And the world that we live in, it has to play by God's rules. I thought it was God that created it. God has dominion over the spirits that try to work around us and among us, that, that cause all the problems that we deal with, that we confront. God is saying, I have complete control over all of this, injustice being that. So while you are called to execute my will, please take courage and know that I will stand for you. I will fight for you as you fight for me. I will, if I need to, shake the foundations of where you stand, the very core of the epicenter of, of injustices. Keep in mind, they were thrown in the center of the prison where it would take an act of God to get them out. This is what God would do for you, that he would shake the core, that he would go the distance to share with you Injustice will not stand. And as long as you stand for me, I'm going to stand for you. I'm going to fight for you. And everybody will know that you were sent by me. Imagine this now as I close. We're introduced to Paul and Silas in this story by the soothsayer, by the fortune teller, as men of God servants of the Most High God. Publicly, we've seen these men thrown in prison. But imagine these men who were thrown in prison for doing the Lord's work. All of a sudden, they pop up again. They're seen publicly again. This will alert everybody else in the world, in that, in that area, to who God really is that clearly he is the champion. He is the one that should be followed, that God is real, that not only will he allow for injustice to not stand or to, to be confronted and to be um, beaten for this woman, that he'll also do it for these brothers who are thrown in jail unjustly. Everybody's now aware that this is a God that we serve. And based on this, based on this story, based on what the Bible says about who God is, you have no reason to believe that if you execute God's will in moments of injustice, that, that God won't come for you, that God won't do for you. I know it can be scary in the moment, but you got the spoiler alert. You know how the end is going to be you know how this story is going to end for you. That as long as you fight for God, God will fight for you. I encourage you to take courage that whatever you see around you that is annoying you, that you got to do something about it. Find courage in knowing that God is going to take care of it when it's all said and done. Amen. We serve a God of justice. And that God's got your back. Pray with me, family, wherever you are. And gracious God, once again, we turn to you with thanks on our lips and in our hearts, all over our spirit, O oh Lord, because we know the type of God that you are. Among everything, you are a God of justice. And God, we thank you for giving us courage that no matter what we encounter, God, you got us, that we, you will take care of us. And that because we have confidence in you and what we will do, what you will do, we have courage that we can do something about what injustices show up and pop up around us. We take courage in your resume. We take courage in what you did for Paul and Silas. And God, we're believing that you will do it for us too. So continue to empower us and give us the capacity to work and to do something for your kingdom and your sake. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. And so, family, I thank you for your time today. And I want to quickly encourage you. Uh, you all know what's happening this Saturday, 10 p.m., 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. I want us to try to combat some injustices in our community now. We know that uh, equity or, or money and how people are uh, given resources, that is unfair in our area. And so we want to do maybe a small part, but still try to do our part into helping families 
to get necessary resources just to help them out. So we are having our diaper drive, our diaper giveaway now. Thanks to all those who contributed through donating diapers and donating money so that we can buy more diapers. Uh, I praise God for you and your efforts. You all have been amazing, amazing in your contributions. And now this weekend, we're going to give it all away. So please spread the word. If you know a family who has, is maybe in need, or you know a family who has a little one, um, just tell them. Tell them on Saturday at 10 o'clock, tell them pull up. They're going to come, we're going to get their size, and they're going to get their diapers. And if you don't know anybody, look, next time you're in a store, look, if you, dry, if you walk by the diaper aisle and see somebody standing there, just tell them, look, do you need some diapers? Come see us on Saturday, 402 Singleton Place. Just drive up, get you some, and go on about your business. Y'all, this is a giveaway. We want to help those who may need help right now. If they need help, they'll take you up on your invitation. You ain't got to know them, know their name. It'd be good to know who they are, but by all means, extend the invitation and let them know that Mount Zion is here for this community. So please share this information with them. I know the graphic, the image is online. So if you're watching this on Facebook, you have access to the image right there. Just download that thing. Text that thing out. Send it out to as many people as you can. Uh, if you're watching, if, if you need to, email this image out. All right, send this to somebody. Let them know. Saturday, come on out here. Come on out. Get what you need and go on about your business. But please know that God loves you. God's got you. And so do we. We're here. We are Mount Zion. Bless you all. Thank you for your time. I will see you all not next week because next Wednesday we will be hosting the Lebanon annual session. So there will not be any Bible study next week. This is the week of the 16th. So please don't return for that. But that following week, then we will be here. So I can't wait to see you all. That will be Wednesday, uh, August the 25th. So join us for that Bible study. I will see you all then. Family, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So until that day, Take care.